handwriting on the rock wall with that old shout. Daniel 5, 1 through 31. Belshazzar the king made a great feast to a thousand of his lords and drank wine before the thousand. Belshazzar, while he tasted the wine, commanded to bring the gold and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple which, were, which was in Jerusalem, that the king and his princes and wives and his concubines might drink therein. Then they brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God, which was at Jerusalem, and the king and his princes and his wives and his concubines drank in them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and of silver, of brass, of iron, of wood, and of stone. In the same hour came forth the fingers of a man's hand and rolled over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall, of the king's palace, and the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Then the king's countenance was changed, and his thoughts troubled him, so that the joints of his loins were loose, and his knees spoke one against another. The king cried aloud to bring in the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers. And the king spake and said to the wise men of Babylon, Whosoever shall read this writing and show me the interpretation thereof shall be clothed with scarlet, and have a chain of gold about his neck, and shall be the third ruler of the kingdom. Then came in all the king's wise men, but they could not read the writing, nor make known to the king the interpretation thereof. Then was King Belshazzar greatly troubled, and his countenance was changed in him, and his lords were astonished. Now the queen, by reason of the words of the king and his lords, came into the banquet house, and the queen spake and said, O king, live forever, let not thy thoughts trouble thee, nor let thy countenance be changed. There is a man in thy kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods, and in the days of thy father, light and understanding and wisdom like the wisdom of the gods were found in him whom the king Nebuchadnezzar, thy father the king, I say, thy father made master of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers. For as much as an excellent spirit and knowledge and understanding, interpreting of dreams and showing of hard sentences and dissolving of doubts were found in the same Daniel, whom the king named Belshazzar, now let Daniel be called, and he will show the interpretation. Then was Daniel brought in before the king, and the king spake and said unto Daniel, Art thou Daniel, which art of the children of the captivity of Judah, whom the king my father brought out of Jewelry? I have even heard of thee, that the spirit of the gods is in thee, and that thy light and understanding and excellent wisdom is found in thee. And now the wise men, the astrologers, have been brought in before me that they should read this writing and make known unto me the interpretation thereof. But they could not show the interpretation of the thing. And I heard of thee that thou canst make interpretations and dissolve doubts. Now if thou canst read the writing and make known to me the interpretation thereof, Thou shalt be clothed with scarlet, and have a chain of gold about thy neck, and shall be the third ruler of the kingdom. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, Let thy <coughs> gifts be to thyself, and give thy rewards to another. Yet I will read the writing unto the king, and make known to him the interpretation. O thou king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar thy father a kingdom, and majesty, and glory, and honor. And for the majesty that he gave him, all people, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him when he uh, would, uh, whom he would be, he slew, and whom he would be, he kept alive. And when he set, he would, uh, he set up, and whom he should be put down. But when his heart was lifted up and his mind hardened in pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne, and they took his glory from him. And he was driven from the sons of men, and his heart was made like the beast, and his dwelling 
was with the wild asses that fed him with grass like an oxen. And his body was wet with the dew of heaven till he knew that the Most High God ruled in the kingdom of men and that he appointed it whomsoever he will. And thou, that his son, O Belshazzar, hast not humbled thine heart, though thou knewest all this, but hast lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven, and that they have brought the vessels of his house before thee, and thou and thy lords and thy wives and thy concubines have drunk wine in thee. And thou hast praised the gods of silver and of gold and of brass, iron, wood, and stone, which see not, nor hear, nor know, and the God in whose hand thy breath is, and whose are thy ways, hast thou not glorified. Then was the part of the hand uh, sent uh, from him, <coughs> this writing was written. <coughs> And this is the writing that was written. Many, many tekel absari. This is the interpretation of the thing. Many, God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Tekel, they are weighed in the balances and are found wanting. <coughs> thy kingdom is divided and given to the means and purchase. Then commanded Belshazzar, and they put Daniel with scarlet and put a chain of gold about his neck and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. In the night was Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, slain, and Darius the Median took the kingdom, being about three score and two years old. And God had his blessing to the reading his word. I dare say. There's been as many a wild party thrown on me, thrown on this mountain. We want to look today, as we've read in Daniel 5, of a wild party. Now, suppose, and I would not recommend to anybody throw a wild party, but imagine if you were King Battle Shatter. And you were throwing a wild party. Liquor flowing, women, concubines, thousand people. You was having, having a good old time. And then suddenly, on a white wall, a giant set of fingers started writing. Now, I don't know about you, but I'd be plumb scared. The word says his knees were knocking, his loins was a shake. I want us to look this morning at reading the writing on the wall. Now we're going to get to the meaning there in just a minute, but there's a little bit of historical context involved. Now, last Sunday we looked at Belshazzar's. We believe that it was his grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, of course, was the king of the Babylonian Empire. And we saw that Nebuchadnezzar, God wanted to get his attention. We saw that Nebuchadnezzar was out in the field, all grown hair and claws like a wolf, <coughs> like an animal, out there grazing in the field. And Nebuchadnezzar, I do honestly believe, became a believer in the Lord. He became a Christian, so to speak. Uh, I, I mean, if I had to go through that, if I had to go through gazing and grazing in the field like an animal, I believe I would acknowledge the Lord too. But we see uh, in, in, in this particular context, by the time of Daniel 5, uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar had ruled Babylon for about 45 years. And he had been dead for about 25 years. And the fourth king after him was Nabonidus. Nabonidus had a son, Belshazzar. Now, he, Belshazzar and Nabonidus were sort of co-regents over Babylon for about 20 years. From uh, roughly 559 to 539, they were in together. Now, Nabonidus was living in what is today Saudi Arabia and Belshazzar in Iran. Now Belshazzar 
was a very insecure man. He was not a Christian. He was not a believer in the true God as his grandfather had the connection. Now, uh, that, you know, that's, that's a strange thing. In families, you have good godly people and then you have those that don't turn out too godly and too good. This was the case here of Belshazzar. So he was a very uh, insecure man covering up his many insecurities. But as we join the party, we see that the great kingdom of Babylon is under siege or under attack by the Medes and the Persian. In fact, the capital city was surrounded by media Persian armies. Now they've already captured his father, Namedus, and Belshazzar knows it. So why is he throwing this great party, this great feast, if he knows that they've got his father, why is he doing it? Well, he has a false sense of security. The Babylonian Empire was the greatest empire in the world at that time. City 60 miles in circumference, surrounded by a wall 350 feet high and 87 feet across. In other words, you could raise four chariots side by side all the way across uh, on that wall there in the city. And the Euphrates River there ran through the middle of the city. Then there was a 30-foot boat outside the wall that runs around the city. So he would have good reason to think, well, I ain't got nothing to worry about. This city's impregnable. There's no way that the Medes and the Persians could get in here and, and do anything. Now that's a false sense of security. He thought, Belshazzar thought that everything was all right, but it wasn't. Because this very night, his life would end and his kingdom would go to the Medes and the Persians. Now the people there, the kingdom, Belshazzar, they thought they were secure. And by the standards of the 6th century, they were. But we're going to see this, this very night, the last night of Belshazzar, that the Lord will take away his kingdom and give it to the Medes and the Persians. Now, first of all, we have the tragedy of a wasted life. We see Belshazzar in his bottles. It was a night of drunkenness, debauchery, and... Uh, I tell you, folks, they ain't no good in, in liquor. They ain't no good in alcohol. When you get to partake of that and you get into a drunken scene like that, you're not going to have anything but trouble. And that's exactly uh, what was going on here. Any strongholds there of the flesh can lead to a wasted life. And we see there in verses 2 through 4, Belshazzar uh, and his blasphemy. Now, Belshazzar there is, is blaspheming God because he's drinking there of the articles there, the cups and whatever of the temple. And he's attempting to show the superiority of his God <laughs> by ridiculing the God of the Hebrews. He treated God like he was nothing. And there are those today in this world, and it's growing more and more prevalent, that are discounting, that are flat out denying the one true God. Yeah. And they do so at their peril. You know, a lot of people in, in today's society, and what did Jesus say? I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. And there are a lot of people saying, well, there are many ways to God. 
I'll take my own sweet time if there even is a God. Well, folks, I'll tell you, God is long-suffering. It is not His will that any should perish. Now, God's going to give us, He'll give us His amount of time to repent. But there comes a time, as we're going to see with Belshazzar, that that time comes to an end. So he's blaspheming God. We see Belshazzar in his blindness there in 17 through 22. He had the opportunity to know about the one true God because his grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar, in fact, in the scripture there, he says, I have heard of him. I know all about it. Then why did Belshazzar turn out the way that he did? Well, folks, it's not enough just to know with a head. They, the devils, <coughs> they, they know about God, they tremble. The devil don't, you know, he knows there's a, a, a God. Why then would Belshazzar reject the God that his grandfather came to know? Well, it was pride. It was arrogance. He was so caught up in the flesh, so caught up within himself, so self-absorbed. He didn't think anything could happen. He was in, he thought he was invincible. That's the reason a lot of young people carry on the way that they do. They think, well, nothing's going to happen to me. I'm young. I'm invincible. <clears throat> I've, uh, I've seen across the years uh, a lot of car wrecks and several people that I went to school with killed in those car wrecks. They thought they were invincible. But folks, let me tell you, God has control of everything. He has control of our lives. And I mean, He can take the breath out of us just like that, we can fall over. <coughs> but he was blind. He knew about Daniel. He knew about the Lord. But he he just he was blind. He was so focused on his sins and <coughs> his own life. We see Belshazzar in his belligerence. He knew the truth, but he refused to believe it. And he lifted his face toward the one true God in absolute. Defiance. He's saying, I don't want nothing to do with you, God. Get away and leave me alone. Now, God gives us all choices. And He gives us a choice whether to accept Him or reject Him. And on this very night was God's life's with Belshazzar. He's going to give him one more chance to repent. And then he's going to pronounce judgment. He will die. He will be slain by his enemies and his kingdom taken from him. Now, People, everybody, you know, the, uh, a lot of people, especially in the Bible Belt here, they know about God, they know about Jesus, and they know about the cross. And I'll tell you, of any people, we will be totally without excuse on the day of judgment. If anyone could live, especially in these mountains, with as many churches and with the true preaching of the Word of God, and not accept Jesus, they can't stand before the Lord and say, well, I didn't know. They will not have uh, that option. Now we see, secondly, the tragedy of the wrath of God. Belshazzar issued a challenge, the Lord answered it. And there in verses 5 through 28. And Belshazzar is shaking the core when he sees the hand of God. Now imagine, and it, it there was a white wall plaster there on the wall. Now, 
you can liken it to the Eagle PowerPoint presentation, almost, except the big fingers are right in there on board. Suddenly, he's having a good old time, just hooping and hollering, out of drunkenness, and then suddenly, he sees the hand of God. We've all uh, made the statement, and it comes from this text, the handwriting on the wall. You know, if you see the handwriting on the wall about something, it usually means, hey, I'm, my, this job is done for me, or my time, or whatever, has passed, and that's, that's the way it was with that child. I'd be scared to see that big giant him, God, writing there those three words. So they bring Daniel in. They try to get their astrologers and their soothsayers in there to interpret the, the message. They couldn't do it. So they bring in old Daniel, the great, uh, the great one who had uh, ministered there to Nebuchadnezzar and who was, had been in the Babylonian Empire since he was 14 years old. He had a, a great place there in the kingdom. And, and Belshazzar says, anyone that can interpret this dream will be have a third place in the kingdom, will be a ruler, and I'll put a gold robe and a chain, uh, or a purple robe and a chain around it. So Daniel, he comes in, He's brought into the banquet. And there, as we read, he gave uh, Belshazzar a little history lesson about what went on with Nebuchadnezzar and how he wound up out in the field uh, there grazing like an animal. So he teaches him a little history and a little theology. Now, Daniel knew what was going to happen. How would Daniel know? Well, he read the 50th and 51st chapters of the prophet Jeremiah. And he knew what God was going to do to Babylon. In other words, old Daniel says, I don't want none of your kingdoms. I don't want none of your whatever. And uh, But sadly, Belshazzar had gone too far. Because the message that, that Daniel would give Belshazzar would be one of impending and final doom. Belshazzar is about to face the awesome wrath of an almighty God. He had been numbered, numbered, weighed, and uh, divided. The, king, the time of judgment has arrived. Now we see here the fact of the wrath of God. God most certainly is a God of love. Go back to 1 John 4, 7, and 8. Love is the very essence and the very nature of God. But he also has a side of wrath. And I think today we overemphasize the love of God at the expense of de-emphasizing the wrath of God. Now God is love. God is love. God is long-suffering. He'll only go so far. And he will give his people and he'll give sinners the chance to repent and come to him. Because he is a God of love. He is a God of long suffering. But the time will run out. And here it's run out for Belshazzar. Now he gave his grandfather Daniel a lot of opportunities to come to the Lord in old Bel era. Nebuchadnezzar did. He took, you know, him out in the field grazing like a wolf man, but God brought Nebuchadnezzar to a saving knowledge. Now, raise the question, well, did Nebuchadnezzar have anything to say about it? Sure he did. He put God off about three or four times. So finally, the last time, and he didn't have to go through that, God brought him around. He accepted the true God 
of the Hebrews. We see the focus of God's wrath. It's focused upon sin and rebellion. Belshazzar had crossed the line and he had to face the wrath of God. God hates sin. According to Proverbs 6, 16, and he'll judge it harshly. I tell you, as the old saying is, we're living in a barred time in this country. We've crossed the line in so many ways. This nation is uniquely, was uniquely formed and founded uh, on the Word of God and Christian principles. And we have stuck our finger in the eye of God. And I hope that we're not too late. We see the finality of God's wrath. Belshazzar is told that he's been numbered, weighed, and divided. He's crossed the line with God and all that remains is judgment. He has no options. He, he, doesn't even, he has no time to repent. Now the message there, I believe it was in Aramaic. Many, many tekel paras. Many, the first word there means number. God has numbered the days of your reign and brought to an end. And then tekel means weight. They're weighed in the balances. You have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. And then peres, and that means divided or separated. In other words, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Now Herodotus, he was a Greek historian, and he corroborated this account of Daniel. And he tells us on the eve of the overthrow of Babylon about the citywide banquet. And during that banquet, the media Persian military commander ingeniously devised a way to divert the Euphrates River that ran into the city so that the water levels around the moat sank just enough to allow his armies to wade across. And there that night, Though the walls of Babylon were very high and massive, they were conquered. They were being conquered there that very moment that Daniel was speaking to Belshazzar. Today is the day of salvation. There will come a time when the mercy and the grace of God will be exhausted. And there when that time passes, folks, there is no more chance to repent. Thirdly, the tragedy of a wretched death. Belshazzar died a sudden death. In that night, while Belshazzar parted, his enemies were encamped around Babylon. He believed that Babylon was safe. He believed that it was impregnable. He believed that the enemy couldn't get in. It could never happen to him. Have you ever believed that yourself? This could not happen to me. And yet it did happen to him. The old saying is, never say never. Never say you'll never do anything. Never, never. Don't ever say that. The judgment of God will come this very night. Death is coming for us all. And if that don't come, Jesus will come. We'll be raptured. Death always comes as a shock, even though we were expecting my aunt to pass on. Still, there's just something about death. We say, well, it'd be better off. Well, that's probably true. But something about the finality of death at least in this life. Of course, there is a better day coming in heaven. Belshazzar died a sinner's death. He died and went to hell. We have no record of him repenting. And I'm sure he's there today. And probably the words of old Daniel a very wise and godly man were ringing in his mind. There are weight in the balances and found one. But I suppose he regrets giving Daniel a necklace mm. instead of bowing the knee to God. 
It'd have to turn out that way for Bell Shadows. You know, uh, I hope everyone here is saved today and is a Christian. If you're not, this is the perfect time to come. Or you may be a Christian.